maybe I'm naive, but I honestly never saw, thought we'd see the day where we'd get over a trillion dollars in debt. So that was really sad and, and really, really disappointing. They could balance that budget within two years if they wanted to. You know, the question right now is whether they want to, and they clearly don't. Hey everyone, it's Franco Terrazano, your spokesperson out here in Ottawa for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. And we've got a doozy of a podcast today. We've got the big cheese himself, Mr. Scott Hennig. He's our president and CEO. He's our fearless leader here with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Now, if you've been following the CTF, you, you know that we're all about fighting for lower taxes, less waste, and of course, more accountable government. But if you're following the federal government, you could be forgiven for being a little bit too pessimistic these days. Uh, so Scott, let's start off the top with how exactly is it that taxpayers can win this fight for lower taxes and less waste? Yeah, well, no, I get I get what you're saying, Franco, and that you know, we go through these cycles, right, of being pessimistic, being optimistic. I guess maybe just being around this long, like I just I don't get into that anymore. I don't get down too far down. I don't get too far up. You know, John Williamson, who used to work for us, had had a saying, uh, you know, no, no defeat was forever. No victory was everlasting. You know, it, it always sort of comes back around and you're constantly fighting a lot of the same battles. I mean, look at the battles we're fighting today. We're fighting battles uh, that we had won back in the 1990s, uh, again, in balanced budgets and the things like that. So. Uh, yeah, look, uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, the one thing that always sort of gives me hope is that knowing that politicians are mostly uh, self-interested uh, in getting themselves reelected. And that's great. Like uh, people talk about like worrying about populists and all that thing right now. I think populist politicians who worry about getting reelected are the greatest things ever because they have to listen to, to their constituents. And in this case, uh, you know, we know that provided that we can get enough Canadians to push back and enough Canadians on side on an issue, we will eventually win the, the day. And that's really what, you know, what I think we need to focus on and what uh, Canadians who are a little bit maybe feeling beat up or feeling down about, uh, you know, maybe their government's not doing things the way they want. Just hang on. Just keep pushing, keep talking to your neighbor and you will eventually win the day. If you're if you're the if you're in the right, you will win the day eventually. Hey, talk to me a little bit, because there's an issue that I hear sometimes, right? Oh, this guy's in office. This guy, he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't know how to spend money well, no matter what you say. But then there's also a flip side, right? Because you hear, OK, well, we just need to get this one person elected. We just have to get this one good guy in office. Tell me why that's not right. Yeah, I, you know, again, I, I, I'm so pessimistic because of years of watching like, oh, no, this is just this one more election. Actually, I find that it's really dangerous to be putting all your eggs into the election basket. Like, I find that so many people get hyped up around an election like, oh, my guy's going to win and it's all going to get better. And then their guy loses and then they kind of just like give up like, oh, well, I tried. I tried. I give up. And that's the problem with putting your eggs into these election baskets, because there's no guarantees ever. I mean, look at uh, I mean, look at the things that people have said when they're in opposition that don't translate over when it comes into to office. I mean, I mean, famously, uh, and we'll pick on some conservatives here. Stephen Harper, when he was the head of the National Citizens Coalition, yeah. he went to court to fight the gag law. Right. He they they went right to the Supreme Court. There is the, the main decision on the gag law right now is Harper v. Canada. Uh, and when he got into office, he had a decade in office. Gag law? Yeah, totally right there. Did not change a thing on the gag law in Canada. So, you know, I mean, it, it's stuff like that. Or, or Jason Kenney bringing back in bracket creep oh. in Alberta after fighting that forever. <laughs> and you, I'm, I'm, I'm singing to the choir here because I know that was your one of your big pet peeves. But like stuff like that, like politicians are are going to do what they're going to do. And they often run out of good ideas. I mean, I remember talking to one politician who said that, you know, like after a couple of years in office, like you've used all your great ideas up. If they had anything to begin with. with. Well, <laughs> right. You know, they, they've used all their intellectual capital up and they're they're kind of grasping at straws. And that's where groups like ours have to come in and provide them all the straws to grasp at and, and know where they can go and provide. You know, there's there's think tanks too. look, there's lots of good think tanks out there doing white papers and giving them good ideas. So, I mean, there's there's a whole infrastructure around these politicians that even if they're inclined to make bad decisions, you know, we can we can drag them back in the right direction. But you can't ever just think, OK, I just got to get this one guy elected because even if they do it. And in fact, uh, this is a bit of a preview of my uh, my lead editorial in the in the next magazine that's coming out, uh, there are some huge hurdles. Like, I mean, and I know we're probably hinting at me, you know, maybe if 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 just they change the the prime minister, things would change. Well, 
there's a whole infrastructure of of uh, of Ottawa that you're having to fight against. You're having the bureaucracy is massive and they have a lot of power. The Senate, the Senate is a, is an area where we haven't really spent enough attention on it recently. Uh, the Senate is is a completely different animal than it was, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the Senate now is full of all these people who the prime minister is convinced that they're brilliant, eminent, free thinkers who can decide to overrule the elected House of Commons. And that's great when it works in our advantage, like on things like Bill C-11, where we've been able to push the Senate. They're looking at making amendments. That's a good thing. But what happens when you have a prime minister in place, uh, you know, maybe five years from now, who's got a different view of the world? and wants to make some changes and the Senate is trying to block it. So there's a lot of hurdles out there and you can't just rely on one guy to fix everything. It's going to take uh, it's going to take the entire country all pushing on this uh, on these issues. I do want to get into the hurdles in a second. I want to dive deeper, but I, let me just sum up some of the things that I heard from you. So number one is you can't rely on the politicians, right? You, you, we always have to keep pressure on them. And the way the Canadian Taxpayers Federation has been so successful, uh, especially in recent years, is because we have a huge army of taxpayers that are always pushing, right? We're always vigilant. We're always pushing. Now, let me just give some examples of some recent wins with the taxpayer army. Now, we've been hammering the governor general for going on a week-long trip to the Middle East, more than a million bucks. What did you get for it as a taxpayer? Well, I don't know if you got anything out of it, even though they were enjoying beef Wellington, beef Carpaccio, and uh, over a hundred bucks of VIP sliced fruit. I need to work that into my next contract negotiation, folks. Um, so the reason that we have got some wins on there is um, because our supporters have been hammering the members of parliament at that committee, uh, not letting them off the hook. And, and members of parliament are dragging the bureaucrats back to committee because our our supporters have been pushing them. You mentioned the Senate with Bill C-11. We have got some good changes in the Senate because our people have been hammering away. The same thing happened on the Emergencies Act when our supporters emailed uh, the Senate constantly to get some wins there. So that's how we're getting wins. Scott, let's let's dive a little bit more into the challenges in the year ahead for us lovers of smaller government and more accountability. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no shortage. I mean, obviously, cost of living inflation is one that uh, is, isn't going to go away quickly and is going to be very painful. I mean, I just saw a report. Uh, I just saw a report today. I think it was out of one of the banks said that you now have to have an income of two hundred and forty thousand dollars in order to get a mortgage in Toronto. Like, I mean, that <laughs> that's crazy. Like, that is crazy. That is a broken system. We are the one of the low, we're the second largest landmass country in the world. Like we should be able to to build houses, build pe- places for people to live without any problem. Like we're not constrained. We're not Hong Kong. We're not a little island. We should be able to build anywhere and house prices should be next to nothing. Yet we've got some of the highest ones in the world. It's crazy. And I think that that's going to that's going to continue to be a painful, hard issue for a lot of a lot of Canadians. Obviously, the carbon tax, we're seeing it go up on April 1st. I mean, that is one we've already seen energy prices rocket over the past year here. Um, I mean, we're fortunate we're not Germany. We're not in a situation where where we're relying on foreign powers to, to heat our homes. But I mean, look, we've still got super high prices. We've got taxes going up. We've got a government that seems to have their head in the sand on this issue. And uh, that's going to be very painful. I mean, I've just I've been getting uh, people emailing me copies of their uh, their heating bills yeah. here recently. They're crazy. Like these carbon tax levels are crazy. And it's really pushing people to a, a situation of like heating or eating. Like those are the choices people are having to make. And that's that's worrisome. So I'm worried about that. Look, uh, you know, there's uh, those are the big ones for me are the, are the big cost of living issues, the pocketbook issues for Canadians. Um, and then, you know, obviously there's always accountability issues like politicians, the longer they stay in the off in office, the more they want to avoid accountability. And they're all about democracy and accountability when they're in opposition. They're all about control and power uh, after that. And, and we've seen uh, we've seen movement out of this government that is more command and control than I would like. I mean, bills like this bill, C-11, trying to control what uh, what Canadians see on the Internet like this. This is uh, this is stuff that I wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have dreamed would be happening in, in a, a country like Canada 10 years ago. I'm glad you brought up the that point about the longer that they're in office. That reminds me of probably my favorite quote. I forget who said it, but the longer you're there, the more the swamp starts to feel like a hot tub. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm glad you I'm glad you brought up the carbon tax and the policy aspect of it. Let's talk about the tactical aspect of the carbon tax fight. I mean, you've been here since we really started the carbon tax fight years ago. Where do you think we stand tactically on this fight? 
Yeah. So, I mean, for me, it's pretty simple math. Like, and it always has been. Um, if you can get 55 to 65 percent of Canadians opposing a carbon tax, you will eventually get a government that will remove your carbon tax. I mean, that that is that is the simple, simple math. It is not about you know what the globe is warming at or what our CO two emissions because that's all that is all fluff and BS. We all know that Canada, even if we eliminated every single carbon emission from all of Canada, we don't make a any difference in world world global uh, emissions and we're not changing the climate with Canada's emissions alone. But what does change is again our politicians who want to get reelected if we get to 55 to 65 percent of Canadians opposed to a carbon tax we win. If we go back rewind to 2015 those were the dark days I'll tell you like I remember 2015 you had the federal government coming in bringing in a carbon tax you had the Alberta NDP bringing in a carbon tax in that province you had uh, Ontario was bringing in a cap and trade you had Quebec with a cap and trade BC had long had a carbon tax everyone was on the carbon tax train in fact I just went and looked at some polling the other day at that time back in 2015 you had like 75 percent of Canadians were in favor of some sort of cap and trade system that, that they thought would you know benefit the, the environment they didn't think about how it was going to hit their their own pockets at that time but they were you know thinking oh, we want to be good to the environment and everyone does and that's great but today so I, well, sorry back at that time it was us and it was Brad Wall, Premier of Saskatchewan. Those are the only <laughs> two people, two groups, uh, us and Brad Wall, were the only ones talking about, you know, why a carbon tax was a bad idea. I'll tell you, it felt very lonely at the time. In fact, even in Alberta, when you had, you know, the government announce their carbon tax here, you had all the oil companies. Like it wasn't even, we couldn't even rely on the oil companies to say no to a carbon tax. All the big oil companies were lining up on stage, you know, patting each other in the back, all happy about making uh, making uh, their their product more expensive for for people to buy. It was crazy. Now, fast forward back now up to today, there was a poll done in November, right after the fall fiscal update. Uh, it was 62 percent of Canadians were disappointed that the government didn't reduce carbon taxes or gas taxes to try to provide some relief. That is a good number. And that number, along with people who are opposed to the carbon tax, I feel very positive. Uh, now, do I think we're going to get it ended before, uh, you know, before April 1st and the, the and it, when it goes up? No. But we have seen other countries like Germany, for example, who have frozen their carbon tax this year because it's already sky high prices. Maybe could we get a freeze out of this government? Maybe. Uh, I don't know if they're going to eliminate it right now, but uh, the movement and the people have started to really shift on this issue. So I'll tell you, as 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 dark as it may seem right now with price, taxes going up, I'm feeling very positive towards our ability to, to kill this carbon tax over the next few years. Yeah, and, and I'll just point out too, I mean, remember heading into the last federal election, you even had... Uh, what was his name again? Um, oh, yeah, Aaron O'Toole. Remember him? Blast from the past, the old official uh, opposition leader who signed the CTF pledge to scrap the carbon tax just before the last federal election. Even he, he broke his promise. So they were dark days. But then you fast forward today. Obviously, the new leader of the official opposition is, is very much opposed to the carbon tax. Uh, but then you also have the premiers in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario. You have the Atlantic premiers who are speaking out against the carbon tax hikes from the federal government. You've even he heard the premier in Quebec uh, hammer the federal government about stepping on provincial their provincial toes. So I do agree it looks a lot better today. One other tactical question I have for you, right? We're, we're against big deficits. We're against big debt. But where does the, the fight for lower debt and balanced budgets, where do we stand on that fight? Yeah, you know, that that's one that uh, I'll tell you two years ago when when governments were when they crossed over that that one, the federal government crossed over the one trillion dollar mark um, and our debt clock was broke. And, you know, I, I just like I remember those days and just thinking like I never thought we'd see the day. I honestly like I maybe I'm naive, but I honestly never saw, thought we'd see the day where we'd get over a trillion dollars in debt. Um, at least not in my lifetime. And uh, so that was really sad and, and really really disappointing and, and kind of disheartening. But today we're seeing really good signs. I mean, you did the math on the federal government budget. They could budget that they could balance that budget within two years if they wanted to. You know, the question right now is whether they want to and they clearly don't. But we've seen like, Alberta's running a surplus now, like we're seeing surpluses in in uh, in um, B.C., you know, Saskatchewan, like Manitoba's getting their deficit down, paying off some debt like Quebec. Like we're seeing a lot of provinces where they're actually starting to get back to balance, which again, I thought at that time, like, oh, we're going to be a decade to get this back in order. And it's happened this quickly. Now, to be fair, 
they've got a lot of extra money from the feds inflation is driving up their their tax revenue uh in a place like oil a place with alberta and saskatchewan where oil and gas prices have gone up they're getting windfall revenue so some of this is a not i would say artificial but it is certainly uh moved faster by a couple of these factors but um we also saw importantly and again you know this is back to a numbers game for us we saw debts deficits go from you know like a, a you know bottom of the top 10 list for people the people's concerns up to the top three like that is rocketed back up that has become a you know along with health care and cost of living that is one of our top like, three issues we're seeing for canadians that's really what it takes that's what it took back in the 90s it took canadians to get upset and push back on government's deficit, government debt and deficits for the governments to actually take action. And that was a liberal government that hadn't really, you know, hadn't really been known for being, you know, deficit hawk, certainly not under uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, it wasn't a deficit hawk uh, government, but under John Cretchen, it became a deficit hawk government. So things can change pretty quickly. That wasn't a long period between those two governments. Uh, and certainly the Mulroney government wasn't uh, deficit hawks. But bringing in the Reform Party and them pushing, I mean, the world changed really quickly in 1993, and I can certainly see that happening again. Yeah, and and you know, I, certainly when when we talk to our supporters, it seems very clear to me that people are have a better understanding and are more aware of how the federal government's debt how the money printing, purchasing up all the government bonds led to inflation. So it certainly seems to me that people are kind of putting two and two together, right? The cost of government is driving up the cost of living. And mm -hmm. then on the pro provincial side, right, even just setting aside some of these balanced budgets, we're seeing the Alberta government uh, suspend gas taxes and the sneaky backdoor income tax hike known as bracket creep, the Ontario government um, cutting gas taxes as well, New Brunswick providing income tax relief up to about 1,300 smackers. So uh, that's good news there. Uh, Scott, let's talk about the organization, how the CTF is doing, but more so pull back the curtain for us here and, and, and tell our listeners how we as an organization decide what fights to jump into. Yeah, so sh show them the blindfold and the dartboard. Um, <laughs> yeah. randomly pick. Yeah. Look, I've said to a lot of people when, you know, I get a call from someone saying like, oh, why aren't you fighting this issue? I'm like, look, there are a hundred issues we could work on in any day. Honestly, like easily there's a hundred issues that we could focus on, on on any given day. So how do we hone in and not, we can't work on a hundred and working on a hundred would be not as effective as picking a few core issues that we really want to fight on. And so it's, you know, again, math, like we go talk to our supporters, we poll them, we ask them uh, where they're at. And we just, just, just finished a, a very large supporter survey. Um, I think over 100,000 people responded to that that supporter survey. Uh, we got really good feedback. We have our marching orders now. Things obviously change, uh, you know, with with uh, what's happening in the news and what's happening in public policy. And when governments try to bring in new laws, things will change. Uh, we also so we 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 we're trying to be very adaptive, right? Like we don't lock ourselves into just one campaign we're going to work on all year. And and even if no one cares about it, we can't get Canadians interested. We're just going to keep plowing along. You know, we we do look at constantly like what uh, what are people fired up about? What do we think we can get people activated on? What are we hearing? A lot of feedback from our supporters we're always looking at. We also hire really smart people like you, Franco, to pay attention and and uh, <laughs> and give us good advice on like, hey, I think this is a hot issue right now and I think we can get a win. The other thing, too, is we're, we're always kind of trying to find that issue, you know, the issues that not everybody else is always working on. Like there are the ones where we're all going to pile on because this is it's the hottest thing right now. And, and all it might take is just a one extra little push to get it over the edge. But we're also looking at, like, where can we make the biggest impact? You know, no one's working on this file, so let's go there. And that in part was why we hired an investigative journalist. Right. Like that was one of one of the things that I did when I came in as CEO was was create the position. And, you know, that when we when we said to that person, when we hired uh, James was our very first uh, hire. We said to him, like, you're not you're not writing the daily whatever everyone else is writing story. You're not going to just go and, you know, grab the government news releases and just copy them out and, and get some other extra quote. You're going to go look for the stories that nobody else is telling. You're going to look at government waste stories, accountability stories, and you're going to go find those and only those. And if anyone else has written that story, back away from it and let them do it, because there's a shortage of there's a shortage of groups like ours out in the country. There's a shortage of good investigative journalists out there in the country. You know, we can't, we, if we're just replicating the work that someone else is doing, we're not doing our job. So, 
Um, you know, we're looking for those issues that are, are of a, a, the greatest importance to our to our donors and our supporters. And we're looking for opportunities where no one else is talking about these issues so that we can make the biggest impact. What are you what are you most excited about with the future of the organization? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a couple couple things. One is our, our youth wing, uh, Generation Screwed. Now, we, we started that back in boy, 2014 ish, I think is when we started it. And uh, the idea was that, you know, we're, we're looking around on these campuses, we're hearing from our supporters that there's a bunch of, uh, you know, these, these, a lot of these universities are full, packed full of communist professors who are uh, <laughs> teaching only sort of one view of the world, and they needed someone else there to, to help push back. And you got the poster right behind you there. Um, you know, it's about uh, these are the people who are going to inherit our country and they're going to inherit a lot quicker than we think. Like it's going to be, uh, you know, 20 years from now, the kid who's in university is going to be the cabinet minister who's making these decisions. And uh, it, it is uh, it's it's of the utmost importance that we go and give them the tools to ensure that they know how to fight back and they know the difference between wrong and right. And they're not just being fed one sort of narrative of the world. And so the pandemic really did a number to our to our organization, the Generation Screwed organization. Um, you know, all campus clubs. Like it wasn't just us. Every single campus club, whether it was the Campus Ski Club or or the you know the Generation Screwed Club, they were all shut down basically. And it was hard to recruit, especially at universities. You all you join these clubs in your third and fourth year, it seems, or you're the leadership of these these clubs in your third and fourth year, and then you graduate. So you often only have a year or two to kind of do what you want to do. And if we don't replace them with another third or fourth year student, the club dies. And that's what happened during the pandemic was that they shut down all the universities. They couldn't get together. They couldn't have events. We tried to do Zoom events, but what kid who after spending six hours on Zoom classes all day wants to then go sit and talk about, uh, you know, uh, all uh, generation screwed stuff in the middle of the evening after the, you know, on, on Zoom again, they want to get out of their apartment and get some, get some fresh air. So we found that that really, we had to kind of, kind of had to put it in storage for a couple of years. We've brought it out of storage. We've relaunched it. Uh, Gage, our new executive director came in, uh, who's now our Prairie director, but he came in and relaunched it, did a great job. He's got it to the point now where we thought it would be in two years. We thought it would take two years to build it back up to the point it is now. There is a lot of enthusiasm on campus. The kids are really interested in talking about these issues. They're seeing their future. They're worried about their future. They're looking at things like, how am I gonna be able to get a job? How am I gonna be able to afford a house? How am I gonna pay all these taxes? You know, it's, uh, they're concerned about their future and they're, and they're willing to fight back. And, and that's really encouraging to me. The other thing that I'm really encouraged about is the future, and I talked about our investigative journalists, but the future of our investigative journalism wing. Uh, James has moved on from us. We've hired a new investigative journalist. Uh, he's starting in a, I, know, I guess by the time this airs, he'll probably have started. Uh, I'm not gonna let the, the, the cat out of the bag, but uh, we got a really, really, yeah, got a really good one. We got a guy with a lot of experience who's uh, gonna be coming in. Uh, who's fired up to go and expose government waste, talk about accountability issues. And with the way the media is going, um, you know, we need more, more independent journalists like this who are willing to go and do the digging that, the, that you know, 15, 20 years ago, the journalists used to do. And they just don't have the, they don't have the resource, they don't have the capacity, and they're not training them in the same way. Like all the, all the good investigative journalists, it seemed, were, were you know, in their 60s and retiring and were not being replaced by a lot of these news outfits. So uh, us tracking down one and, and getting a really good one on staff, I'm, I haven't been this pumped uh, about a, a new staff member since, uh, since we hired you, Franco. Uh, yeah, he doesn't mean that. that just... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, speaking of hiring new staff, Scott, you were a new staff member with the CTF way back in uh, 2005, I believe. That was when yeah. you first started and, and you came up. You were our, our Alberta director, my uh, second favorite Alberta director on this Zoom call, I'd say. <laughs> um, but in seriousness, you know, how has how has the fight for lower taxes and more accountability changed since you first started with the CTF? Yeah, well, two ways. One is technology, and 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 the other one is media. Um, I mean, I'll start with technology. We, when I started in the Alberta office, and we had this beautiful office that overlooked uh, our beautiful location. It wasn't a beautiful office. The office was kind of dingy, actually, but beautiful <laughs> location right by the Alberta legislature. Um, and you had to be right next to the legislature. That was one. Um, but we used to fax 
news releases. Like you probably have never seen a fax machine, Franco. Like we, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we used to fax them out. We would, we'd email them as well, but we'd make sure those newsrooms were getting them via fax. And that's who we were focused on. Our focus was on, on trying to influence the media because the media was speaking to the public. That's how we got our message through, through the media to the public. If we were going to change hearts and minds of, of Albertans and Canadians, um, that's how we were going to do it is through the media. So that has changed uh, a lot more with the technology. We were able to go directly to Canadians a lot better than we used to be able to 15, 20 years ago. Um, I mean, I look at our email list size has exploded over the past, uh, you know, five, six years. I look at, our, you know, the ability to reach people through social media has exploded. So the way that we just contact people is is very different. And, and our focus as an organization, our tactics have changed. Um, now, we're still, you know, I still think there's an opportunity to uh, get through the media and, and expose your message. And we still obviously do that. And, you know, we have great guys like you who write excellent op-eds and we're feeding those in. Uh, but more and more, we're focused on how do we get an army of Canadians to push back on these issues and identify the issues that they're most passionate about and get them to take action. And, and we think about that first rather than third or fourth or last, rather than the other way around, which it used to be, think about how do we get this into the media? Who do we need to talk to? Which journalist should I talk to? That's now maybe second or third on our list instead of first. But in, in, and I guess playing into that, I remember in 2005 going down to the Alberta Legislature Press Gallery. It's in the basement right next to the cafeteria. So you got you can smell the meatballs in there. And, you know, the famous location where Jason Kenney, when he was working for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, got into the got into the uh, the one on one match with uh, former Alberta Premier Ralph Klein. Right there is where the press gallery is. And uh, I used to go down there and I, you know, hand out my news releases or reports or whatever I was working on. And I would spend hours going door to door. There was 20 journalists down there in their offices. Fast forward even 2009, like we're still talking, you know, we're still talking uh, 14 years ago. It was a it was a dead zone. Like it was a ghost town. You could you could set up a bowling alley down the hallways and not disturb anybody like it was completely empty. And we've seen that continue. Uh, newspapers have got thinner, there's less journalists, there's more reusing of material. Uh, journalism has definitely changed and there's been a concentration. Like I remember um, I'd put out a news release and I might get a call from four or five different newspapers. I might do five or six different television interviews and they'd all have maybe a slightly different angle and they'd all be you know covering it differently. But now there's one. Like if you don't get covered by the one outlet that's covering the story that day, you don't get covered. And so one, the, the gatekeepers have become fewer and far between and uh, traditional media is very much changed. So and then you add to that the fact that they're getting big government subsidies and people have a lot less faith in the media. That was completely different. I mean, in my day, you know, what they said was uh, was uh, the, the truth. And today there's a lot of people who have a, a very, very low uh, opinion of the media. They don't trust them. Part of that is what we've seen down in the States and, and the Trump uh, pushed of, you know, fake news and don't trust the media. Some of that's translated up to Canada, but part of it is also uh, whether, you know, you've got good journalists who are doing good work, but they're taking government subsidies. And because of that, uh, people are looking at them with, uh, with a side eye saying, mm, can I trust you anymore? Uh, and I think that's really changed. Uh, that's really changed the landscape. We're going to end on a good note. We're going to end on an optimistic note. So <laughs> one thing, what are you, it could be organization. It could be policy. One thing that you're most excited for in, in 2023. <sighs> one thing. Hey, um, okay. I'll pick something that you probably weren't expecting. I'm looking forward to talking to uh, my colleagues around the world. Um, you know, we, there's, there's over 50 taxpayer groups around the world that are doing the same sort of work that we're doing. And uh, more often than not, we're fighting many of the same battles. Uh, just one example, uh, our friends in the UK fought uh, a very similar tax escalator on beer taxes uh, that we're fighting right now. They fought it 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, the British government brought in the same sort of idea. Taxes were going to go up on beer by the rate of inflation every single year. Uh, they fought that fight 10 years ago and won. Um, and, you know, so and it's very similar, like we're seeing in New Zealand, they're fighting, you know, they just fought, uh, you know, different same fights that we've been fighting maybe five years ago and we're helping them with theirs and we're picking up stuff from each other. So um, I'm really looking forward to we got we finally uh, after uh, a few years here after it's been four years, we're going to have a World Taxpayers Conference again. 
Uh, I'm going to get to sit down with a lot of my colleagues from around the world. We're going to be able to share notes, share best practices and, and figure out how how can we beat back some of these bad ideas that keep popping up? Because it trust me, these politicians, again, they're grasping at whatever. Uh, we, we know that if a bad idea pops up in one country, there's going to be a politician in our country who is taking notes and thinking, oh, boy, like, why don't I just do that here? Well, we do the same thing. We talk to our colleagues in uh, in other countries and figure out what tactics work for them, what didn't work for them in their fights and steal all their best ideas. And there's no competition amongst us. We're all happy to uh, help each other out. And I'm really looking forward to sitting down and, and finding out what uh, what are the next fights that we're going to be fighting and how do we beat them? Scott, thanks for coming on the show today. Yeah, Franco, you're doing a great job. Thanks, buddy. Hey, thanks, man. And for all of our listeners out there, we've got a lot of fights in the year ahead. So here's uh, one way at least that you can help in the fight. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just search Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Head over to our website, taxpayer.com. Check out the newsroom, share those articles, and check out the petitions too, and sign a couple.